welcome. I'm introducing the uh, the Move AR guys today. So welcome, Niall and Tino. Thank you very much, Ollie. Um, so yeah, my name is Niall Hendry. I'm head of product at uh, Move AI, and uh, I shall let Tino introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Ollie. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Tino, founder and CTO here at Move.ai. Amazing. And these guys will be giving you an overview today on how AI powered software is enabling content and studio and social media companies to create better and more engaging content for film, TV, video games, and AR XR experiences. I'll let you guys get started. I'll leave you to it. Thanks, Ollie. So, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to run through initially a little PowerPoint to sort of just give everyone a, an understanding of what it is we do. And then, what I will then do is uh, jump into a demo of our web app and so Tino and I will back and forth on a few bits. So as Ollie mentioned, um, we um, use AI and computer vision as a very much a software first focus on delivering what we call 4D as an ecosystem. Um, that's comprised of three products. So um, we have an augmented reality product for live virtual asset insertion into um, live broadcast. We've got uh, an AI-based depth king solution, which allows us to do layer separation based on depth of field within uh, real-time video. And what we're here to talk about today is AIM, which is our AI-powered markerless mocap system. So really, as Ollie sort of mentioned from the blurb at the top, is our focus as a business is to um, be able to provide software solutions for content studios, um, whether for things like markers, motion capture, um, AR and XR for social media um, and uh, event-based workflows, and for the sports industry, for things like augmented reality in studio or enhanced editorial storytelling based on the um, quality of output we can supply. As I said, we're gonna focus on AIM today. Um, and AIM's a lot of fun. AIM allows us to and allows uh, content creators and studios to be able to do mocap, but without the need to wear a mocap suit. So what we do is we um, set up an array of GoPros. Uh, I'll get into that in a bit more detail in a little bit, but we, uh, we set up an array of GoPros and what that we then do, we calibrate to those and can then start to extract a video in the cloud um, to produce really high quality and uh, natural movement. So we've got authenticity of movement and we've got quality in terms of output. But in terms of the speed, the speed and turnaround is really, really quick. And we'll, Tino will talk to that in a little bit. Um, we can also uh, track separate objects, so like balls, for instance. So we're working on our pipeline to track other objects later in the year. Crucially, um, no suits are, are required for this. And we can capture down to finger level detail. So, what we're trying to do is to sort of democratize the world of motion capture, but also have a high quality output. So, uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions at any point, by all, by all means, either raise hand or chip in or anything like that. Um, as I mentioned, the cameras we support are uh, the GoPro Hero 8, Hero 9, and the Sony RX0 Mark II for when you want a more wired solution. The flexibility of the GoPro Hero 8 and 9, though, allow you to basically a capture anywhere. So provided you've got decent light levels, you can capture in a studio environment, you can capture outdoors. So we've got some examples and in fact, you'll probably see some later in the demo where we've captured for our, on an AstroTurf outdoors or captured on a basketball or a tennis court, you know, COVID allowing, we have to, be able to capture in some flexible places. Um, the RX0 allows you to do uh, very frame accurate synchronization, uh, but also has a sort of cost benefit to that as well in terms of um, the cost being probably about twice as much as a GoPro. So when we do this capture process, what we um, need is an area between three by three to 10 by 10 meters squared. Um, we can support up to three people with more cameras in, a lot, in the larger of that area space. Uh, and we can support a wide range of capture movements. So things like acrobatic movements, like headstands and flips, um, jumping onto a table, jumping off of a table, and large area movements like walking around a large volume or sprinting through one. And the reason that's important is that um, a lot of that is, isn't possible with a suit. Um, and because we capture, um, this is a four by four example, but because we capture 
the person and the area. So we get X, Y, Z data for the person, but we also get the depth of the area as well that they're performing in. So we can actually start to get very, very high quality uh, animation, but relative to the space that that actor is operating within as well. So you can see here that on the left and the right, we've got just a couple of um, six and eight camera setups. So you can see around the radius of that circle, we start to add more cameras in depending on the uh, people in the scene uh, and also the type of movement you want to do. And the reason that's important is because of occlusion. So if you have multiple people in a scene, uh, the fewer angles you have, the less visible they may be. So the idea is that when you add even more people into that scene, that you have more angles to be able to track them uh, in a more high quality way. So uh, basically the equipment is actually really um, low cost comparative to a lot of solutions on the market. So this is, for instance, the GoPro Hero 8 setup. Um, you need the cameras, you need some tripods, which are, you know, very cheap off Amazon. Um, you can get an LED lighting rig as well if you're going to be working in a studio environment. Um, and then the GoPro remote and some markers to put on the floor to define your capture area as well. So, and, you know, we assume that people already have laptops. So, you know, the the starting cost for this is, you know, 1.5K, which comparative to a lot of mocap solutions is actually a lower barrier to entry. So what we're seeing is quite a, a high um, interest in this because of the flexibility it gives you, because you can deploy it wherever you want and in a COVID friendly way, which is important as you know at the minute, but also the barrier to entry isn't cost prohibitive. So um, with that in mind, what we do uh, in terms of, the uh, process is we um, uh, get uh, you, the captures done in your hands. So you're able to capture yourself, uh, the contents you have captured themselves. And then what we'll do is we'll integrate the rig into our AI um, Marcos mocap platform. And then the system will automatically extract the motion and reapp reapply it to that rig. And I'm gonna get Tito to talk through the tech stack in the next slide, but basically, you take your videos, you upload them to the cloud, and it will spit out your mocap data and retarget it to a rig of your choice, if you wish, um, all automatically. So the beauty is in the simplicity of this, provided you do, and we have capture instructions in terms of doing a T pose and an A pose and walking backwards and forwards in an area to calibrate. Once that's done, then any takes you take from that calibration are automatically computed in the, in the cloud. Um, Tino, do you want to just talk a little bit to the sort of the speed of process and the ability to parallel process in the cloud as well? Yeah, so yeah, as Nal said, we've got this, this totally new way of capturing animation now um, using just regular cameras and we can capture this to super high quality. And, and we've been working so hard over the last, uh, the last six to actually 12 months since we've been developing this in, in, so we can turn it around in a speed of which you know, it's practical for your for your standard uh, kind of use cases. Right now, we're at the speed at which it takes around one minute to process uh, one second of of animation for the body. So let's say you have a ten second animation. Let's say it's a you know man walking man walking or I don't know woman dancing. You know it's uh, ten, an animation of ten seconds length. We can turn around in around ten minutes. But but not only does it just run kind of in serial or one by one, we can actually run them in parallel. So let's say one morning you decide to shoot i don't know one hour of footage of, of different animations that you want to put into your content um you can actually and let's say you have multiple 10 second sequences we can process those all in parallel so for example let's say we have 50 motions um all together and each video is 10 seconds long we can actually process all of that in 10 minutes and so rather than having to hand animate rather than having to put on a suit and send that data off for post-processing we can capture really high quality, authentic motion just in 10 minutes. And uh, we've also, we can also capture motion down to the finger, down to the finger level. Um, as, as, any, as anyone who's worked in animation, animating fingers is, is really tough. We can actually get most of the way there using our system. So we can capture the fingers as well. When it comes to processing the fingers, it takes a little bit longer. So right now we're at a speed at which it takes around five, five minutes for one second of, of video. But now if you imagine the whole end-to-end -end process in 10 seconds, for a 10 second sequence now, you can do this in under an hour. You can get really high quality motion and, and many motions at the same time. So it's a much faster than a lot of traditional ways 
of doing this. And, and as we'll show later, we can capture really high quality just straight through the system. Yeah, and um, thanks, Tina. And um, what we also want to get to the understanding here as well is to the, the when it's funny because we call Move AI and the product is called AIM, and therefore people uh, go, oh, well, AI can't do everything on its own, which is true. So what we have put together here in particular is an explanatory slide to say, yes, we use AI to extract motion or to understand people with an image, but there's a whole technical stack on top of that with a whole feature set that gets applied to that motion extraction for us to get the high quality um, output that Tino mentioned. And again, I'm going to throw over to Tino as a CTO to be able to explain this um, in a much more uh, coherent and articulate way than myself. Yeah, so uh, as you'll see later, and, and as I see, saw a bit in the previous uh, slide, so we can capture really authentic motion. And you know, this is fundamentally, it's all powered by artificial intelligence and computer vision. Um, so, you know, machines that we've trained to understand human motion in video, but this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, we apply a whole host of other stack of technologies in order to bring this whole thing to life um, and to bring these high quality results. This includes things like modeling the human body the the joint limits of the human body the you know the muscle the muscle forces that it can attain as well so that when we get the animation through the pipeline it behaves uh, as a human would and so it looks totally authentic as well we also have a lot of integrations with uh, 3d uh, 3d software so maya motion builder unreal unity um, blender so that when you get the results, it'll just go straight into a pipeline that you're probably already used to when it comes to working with animation and 3D content. And as Noah mentioned, this all uh, can run in the in the web, and so we've got uh, we've got a web platform whereby you can you can manage all your projects, upload the video, and and all the crunching gets done in the web. So you don't need a, a high spec machine yourself. You can just have a simple laptop and upload the videos and then that gets processed and you can download the, the motion, which, which can also be retargeted to different characters that you have. So not only do we capture the original motion of the person in the scene, we can also retarget this motion to, to different characters. Thank you, Tina. So um, as if, for instance, here's some example GIFs that if you've been on our website, you'll see as well, from different types of motion that we captured. Um, whether it's cheering, body interaction with the hands, uh, forward rolls, or there's a Ronaldo celebration that Tino captured a little while back on a basketball court. Um, so you can see the different types of um, animation we can do and then the retargeting is going to be really high quality. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flip out into our um, AIM platform. Um, so you can see here um, that I am... Um, in the platform. So um, this is our current beta version of it. So we're going to go live with this in April. Um, we're currently in trials with a few clients uh, at the minute, which are going to again flip into live deals in April. So this is really like uh, the first public view, actually, I think, uh, of the platform. So um, be kind in your reviews, but it will change in terms of its look and feel as it goes forward. So we have we worked a basic project structure. So uh, we have the projects at a top level, which manage everything in terms of content within them. Uh, next down, we have shoot. Now shoot, as I mentioned with the calibration earlier, um, a shoot is defined by its calibration, the sub information within there. So when you, when you calibrate by doing the T pose, A pose, walk forward, backwards, left and right, that camera configuration and that shoot calibration um, allows you then to do as many takes and scenes as you want after that, and then add them to that and store them within that shoot. If, for instance, you were to like uh, set up in the morning and then tear down, set up again in the afternoon, you'd have you'd consider that as a new shoot with a new calibration. If you uh, even if you knocked over one of the cameras <laughs> by accident, you'd have to pick it up and recalibrate, and that would be classed as another shoot as well. So, but once you're in that world, what we can do is uh, some quite impressive stuff. So, I'll go through some of the uh, high level stuff quite quickly. So for instance, if I wanna create a new project, I give it a project title, I give it a description. If I'm going down into a um, shoot I've already done, uh, we can then have a calibration. So if I wanna add a calibration in here, 
what I do is I go in and I give it a title, et cetera. So I give it some information the database needs. Uh, crucial information in there in terms of the calibration actor height. So uh, we put in the height of the person, much like with other mocap systems, so that we can estimate the bone length properly. And then we put the start time, uh, the duration of the calibration sequence, as you may have done more than one in a single uh, clip. Uh, I didn't mention at the top of the call, my cat is going bananas this afternoon. So if you do hear him or if he jumps into the call, I apologize in advance. Um, and the clap time and duration, and that's for the audio sync. We'll talk about that in a little second. But um, if you add, that, add a calibration, then you can obviously add scenes in as well. So you can add a scene in, again, that's a descriptive layer. So for instance, I've got a reaction scene I've done before, and much like uh, the calibration, we can add takes to these scenes. So um, we can give it a title, we can specify the number of people that need to be within the scene. So one, two, three. Uh, we can do the start time again, if you've got a longer clip, uh, and then you've got the duration of the, uh, of the sequence that you wanna extract from. And then you've got the clap start time and duration. Now, I keep mentioning this clap. The reason I say the clap is that we can use a clap aboard to be able to synchronize audio channels uh, within the GoPros. As GoPros are inherently asynchronous, what you can do is use the remote to start and stop recording, but they don't necessarily always record at the same time. There may be a slight difference in terms of when that triggers. So what we do at the start of the, um, of the capture sequence or that take is that we get the actor to either clap three times above their head or if there's a clapperboard on site, then you can use that. What, the reason we do that is we use the audio track to synchronize on the peak of the audio, and that allows us to synchronize all those angles together automatically. Um, so what's great about that is, again, it just does everything for you. So well, as long as you follow that protocol, your uh, results that you can then process will look a bit like this. So we have um, within the UI um, a sync result which you can see here. And again, so this is a sync frame, as you can see our colleague Sam on the Astro. So it gives you this result to just give you a visual representation that all those frames are accurately synced together. And then whilst that's, that's been done as well, you've also then get your results. So as Tino mentioned, you're gonna get the results from the system. One is a uh, retargeted clip, which is applied to a character rig. And the other one is an FBX of the uh, motion as well in terms of the skeleton rendered within the UI too. Now that's all done, as we said, in the background automatically. You can do a couple of things after that. If you're not happy with your results, you wanna try a different calibration or you wanna retarget to a different rig, you can select a different calibration or select a different rig and hit run. And that will then trigger an instance in our cloud I'm going to start through that processing again. Or if, as Tino mentioned, you want to get your results out, you can take it down into FBX, you can take it as an every targeted FBX of the rig, or I'm going to just drop it down into Blender right now. And we can then basically, despite having, you know, three gigs worth of video processed, we can actually download it to a minimum number of meg, I think it's like 50 this file, um, to be able to then go in to the skeleton so we can get a good view of this. So we can go in and we can take off these bones to get a better view of the retargeted rig. And then you can see here that we get both the cameras rendered in the scene. So as I mentioned, we've got that 3D uh, understanding of the world, but you can also see the quality of movement in terms of the reaction to uh, <laughs> the acting that our colleague Sam was doing, he was reacting to um, some <laughs> different things flying at him. And what you can see, as Tino mentioned, the um, quality of the output we're getting due to um, the biomechanics and the rules that we put in terms of uh, holonomic constraints of what joints can do on top of the um, initial AI motion extraction result that's then retargeted through a rig allows us to create really, really high quality motion capture, uh, but also in a very, very simple workflow that allows you to process it, leave it to process and come down and take it out. And then you can either drop that into a, an animation or a gaming engine 
previs or or you can take it and then do any cleanup that you require on that for instance on the hands or maybe if there's anything that needs to be done on the feet um so tino is there anything you'd like to add on top of that i've got nothing nothing else to add but um i suppose maybe it's a good time to open up any questions that that people might have sure chuck your questions in chat and we'll get them answered Go for it, Trezor. Yeah, for sure. So anything we use that uses bones and rigs, any sort of uh, anything where we need bone animations or humanoid animations, we could use this as a capture solution. And since it's only uh, the bones and the animation, we can use it with any sort of model. So we can use it with low poly AR models and VR models. So, um, Jack, if you want to have a, a look through the platform uh, once it's up and running, just uh, if you, I guess our emails will go out after this, Ollie. So, if you want to email uh, myself directly, we can have a follow up chat about uh, trailing it out and having a look at some of the results as well. Any more questions in the chat before we wrap up? Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And it was really interesting to find out more. It's a really exciting technology and I can't wait to use it. Cool. Thanks very much for having us, Ollie. And um, again, just to, uh, if anyone does have any follow-up questions, by all means, Please just drop Tino. Ah, one more question before we go is, is the result similar to Mixamo? Yeah, I can talk about that one. So, so it's similar to Mixamo in the sense that, you know, you get FBX animation um, that, that you can either have on, a, you know, on, on different rigs. Um, we, we can capture super high quality motion and, 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 and this can be retargeted to different characters. So, Compared to Mixamer, we found that the, the quality level is often like very high, but also you can also compress the motion. So if you have, uh, let's say, a mobile application requirement where you don't want motion on every keyframe, it is possible to compress it. So we're still retaining a really high quality of the motion uh, and then being able to put that into Unity or Unreal or, or Maya, whatever you're using. But also we found a lot of applications for any time you know, AAA, you need AAA kind of type content for movies and games. You know, we can we can achieve that AAA quality motion, uh, but then also we can have something that's really flexible and easy to use like Mixamo as well. Perfect, thank you very much. Amazing. Well, thank you guys very much for coming. I think that should wrap up the questions now, unless we have a, a final one pop in. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.